What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be doing something really interesting and really exciting. It's a first for me and uh, something that I've really looked forward to ever since I started to get the idea of how it was going to work and that is a party guile. Uh, what is a party guile? Well it's when you get two beers for the price of one. Boiling it down to its most fundamental concept, a party guile really is when you just take uh, the mash, and you create a beer off of the first runnings from the mash, and then you also sparge fully through that same mash and create a second beer off of the sparge runnings. Um, and essentially what you're going to get is one rather strong wort and one uh, rather weak wort. And the other thing about party guiling is that you can also blend them together at the end of the process so you can get some very unique flavors that way. Or you can go ahead and individually ferment the two different worts, and that's what I'm going to be doing here today. And this technique was really uh, championed, I think, by the British. With British brewing, and Fuller's actually still does this to this day, you would have uh, a party guile of sorts happening and you would create many different beers out of the same mash and it really does increase your efficiency as a brewery. That blending technique leads to some very interesting beer but also some very uh, consistent and reproducible beer at the same time because if things are a little bit off in one batch to another that blending technique will actually help keep your numbers consistent. However it's not only just an English technique it's also a uh, technique that was used in monastic brewing not just the Trappist but also the Germans. There's plenty of monastic brewing that happened all over Europe but that's how you get those singles doubles and triples and the varying strengths but similar flavor characteristics between them party guiling was was one of those techniques that was used. Now I've actually already gone ahead and done the entire brew day. Um, in fact the beers are mostly fermented by the time I'm filming this portion of the video and the reason for that is I needed to tell you exactly what was going to happen uh, because I couldn't fully predict exactly how it was going to go before I uh, went ahead and did my filming. So uh, in a way this is a little bit different than a typical grain to glass but I do want to still tell it all to you nonetheless. In this video, I'm gonna be doing a Belgian double as well as a Belgian table beer. Um, and a table beer is a really cool, interesting concept. It's a very low alcohol beer. In fact, the one that came off of these runnings was two and a half percent alcohol um, with a lot of Belgian flavor. And really, uh, it's something that can be very easily paired with like a lunch meal because um, it's so a low alcohol, it doesn't really affect you, but you get a lot of flavor out of it. And it's it's actually really interesting the way this one turned out. The double, on the other hand, really is another thing I've been looking forward to making. I've made a double within recent memory about two years ago, and it turned out okay, um, but I had some fermentation issues with that one, and I had some hot alcohols in it that I didn't really like, uh, and there were actually a number of things with that beer that could have stand to have been improved, um, but after doing the whole Belgian series that I've been working my way through over the last year or so, um, the double is really one of the last ones I have uh, gotten around to, but it's the final of the four Trappist style beers uh, that I have yet to make. So uh, this will be the last one to check off that list and it's going to be a very similar recipe in construction to the quadruple that I made, the Belgian Dark Strong Ale that absolutely blew my mind last year. Uh, so I'm hoping that I can get a similar effect with some age on this one. A double is going to be not as strong as a Belgian Dark Strong Ale, it'll be probably about 8% alcohol, um, but it's still going to carry a lot of the same flavors, just not with as much intensity. You're not going to get um, a really powerful amount of chocolate and dark fruit and raisin character um, but you are still gonna get a lot of that deep breadiness uh, probably still some of that chocolate and raisin character but just in a little you know, in a little bit less of an amount overall uh, and you will most importantly still get plenty of that Belgian yeast characteristic that is so important in these beers the color should also not be as dark as the quad was it'll be a little bit more on the brown side um, and hopefully it ends up having that nice red tinge come out of it as it clarifies as well. So now I'm going to kind of go over the technique of a party guile in a little bit more detail. If you're just here to see how a party guile works, go ahead and skip over to the brew day section where I'll talk about it more in detail and you can see the steps on camera. Uh, it does help to have a little bit extra equipment here. If you have a couple of different kettles, that's going to help. If you have ideally multiple boil kettles or the ability to do multiple full five gallon boils at the same time, um, that's ideal. But not everybody has that circumstance, but I will be demonstrating that situation. Uh, if you're a little bit creative, you can figure out a way to make it work. So just tailor it to your own circumstance because everyone's going to have a different one. So we're going to start out by heating up about 16 gallons of water uh, as if it was like a 10 gallon uh, batch that I was trying to make. 
Once I reach mash temperature, um, I'm gonna take that 16 gallons of water out of my 20 gallon system and move it into my 10 gallon system. And then I'm gonna take that 10 gallon system, treat it like a giant sparge water heater. As this is going on, I'm going to be conducting the regular old mash for my double. And the, that's about 15 pounds of grain going into about eight gallons of water in the 20 gallon system. And then once that's completed, I'll drain that wort out from underneath the grain bed and that'll become the wort for the double and that's going to go into in my case probably one of my anvil bucket fermenters just for safekeeping until it's time to move it to the boil so once that grain basket is pulled out of the mash and is draining into an empty kettle i will pump sparge water at about 168 fahrenheit from the 10 gallon system up through the spray valve over the grain bed that's in the basket and let that naturally soak through and sparge basically until I get a full eight gallons of whatever gravity wort that's going to be. Once I get about seven or eight gallons of runnings off of that sparge, again, I'm gonna transfer that into the 10 gallon kettle that is now emptied of sparge water and fill that with wort for the table beer. And then I'm gonna take the wort for the double that's been sitting in a steel uh, bucket essentially and transfer that into the 20 gallon kettle and then I'm going to simultaneously conduct boils for them because I'm using a 120 volt element in one boil the table beer and a 240 volt element in the other beer the double uh, these are going to have drastically different heat up times but just know that once you get to that boil section the party guiling piece of it is pretty much done so you basically, at that point, you just carry on as if you're doing a parallel brew day for two different beers. Um, I do want to give a quick shout out though to Northern Brewer for giving me the ingredients for the batch. So do check them out for all those ingredients and also to Claw Hammer Supply who make all of the equipment you're going to be looking at here in terms of systems, both the 10 and the 20 gallon, 120 and 240 volt. Uh, so you will see those in action during this video. Check them out if you're curious about those systems. There's a link in the description box. All right, so the way I'm gonna do this recipe segment, um, I'm just gonna differentiate between the double and the table beer at the same time as I go through each segment of the recipe. So starting out for the grist, the grist is the same uh, because the grist is only for the double. Uh, and then it's just that sparging through that gets you the table beer. So uh, starting out, we're gonna be using 11 pounds of Dingemann's Belgian Pilsner malt, uh, followed up by two pounds of Dingemann's Belgian Munich malt. On top of that regular Belgian Munich, we're gonna be adding one pound of dark Munich malt. Um, that's mostly for color and for a little bit of toastiness, a little bit of kind of like a dark fruit, I hope as well is gonna come out of that. On top of that, we're gonna add three quarters of a pound of Special B, which is a dark roasted crystal malt from Belgium, really is responsible for a lot of those nice raisin and fig flavors you get out of these beers. Um, and then that's the entire grist. For the double and for the double only, we are adding one pound of D180 candy syrup at 10 minutes during that boil. That will add a lot of color and a lot of flavor and a lot of extra alcohol to this beer. So that is uh, an important part for the double. Don't do that under the table beer because then it'll turn into a higher alcohol beer and it might be a flavor imbalance as well. For the hops. Um, the double is pretty straightforward and simple. It is a simple bittering addition of Magnum uh, for about 18 IBUs at 60 minutes. Uh, in my case, that's about half an ounce of Magnum. For the table beer, this is where we add more hops, and this is where the beers start to kind of branch out and become their own thing. So for the table beer, I'm adding uh, actually a decent amount of Styrian Goldings. Uh, I have a lot of low alpha Styrian Goldings. Um, all of them are about 2.7% alpha acid, so there's actually a lot more hop material going in, but um, it actually should give us a really nice flavorful beer. So at 60 minutes, I'm gonna bitter with about an ounce and a half of Styrian Goldings. And then at 10 minutes, I'm going to add an ounce of steering goldings as well. Keep in mind though, you should be looking at your IBUs uh, for this low alcohol beer in relation to your gravity. So what I did was once I found that initial pre-boil gravity of 1021 for my second runnings for the table beer, I determined, okay, how many IBUs is gonna be good for that kind of gravity? And I'm going for about 20 to 23 IBUs overall in the entire beer. And I guarantee you that worked out really well. So keep that balance in mind, especially if your runnings have a lower gravity or a higher gravity when they come out of the party aisle. For the water profile, um, the water is gonna be the same for both beers. So I'm just gonna treat that initial strike water, the whole 16 gallons as I'm heating it up with uh, the following water profile. 
Uh, so I'm going for 60 parts per million of calcium, six parts per million of magnesium, zero parts per million of sodium, 79 parts per million of chloride, 62 parts per million of sulfate, and zero parts per million of bicarbonate. In order to get that water profile, I'm gonna be adding to 16 gallons of Poland spring water, four grams of gypsum, four grams of Epsom, 10 grams of calcium chloride, and that's it. So that should get you uh, a roughly the same water profile for both beers. So for the yeast on this one, I'm also using two different yeasts. The first batch, the double, is gonna get a repitch of WLP 500 slurry that I actually picked up from my time down in York, Pennsylvania visiting Rick at Mexitali Brewing. Uh, so you've seen him in the cream ale video and in the whipped beer video. He was very kind to uh, pass forward some of the yeast slurry off of one of his Belgians, and so I'm gonna use that and pitch that uh, along with a nice starter as well into the double. And that should actually really rip through fermentation and be very nice and healthy fermentation uh, due to that high amount of yeast. For the table beer, I'm gonna be sticking with the tried and true Lalamand Abbey Ale yeast. For the mash in these beers, once again, they're the same. So for the double, uh, this is a typical Belgian step mash that I've been doing for all of my Belgians. They come out really nice. You get that lower final gravity. You get that really, really light body, but really tons of head retention and a really, really good quality head on it. That basically is 30 minutes at 148 Fahrenheit and 45 minutes at 158 Fahrenheit. So for the table beer, the mash really just consists of sparging through the entire grain bed for the double uh, at about 168 Fahrenheit sparge water, eight gallons of that going through, conducting a very slow sparge for about 30 minutes uh, is all you really need on that one until you've collected seven to eight gallons of sparge water and the grain bed has completely rinsed itself through. On the homebrew scale, it's really unlikely that you're gonna ever over sparge just due to the volume of things. That's more of a professional brewing concern. Um, so it would be interesting to see what would happen if you went through a third time and did a third guile to get a third wort. Um, but it would certainly be a non-alcoholic wort um, and you would require a third kettle <laughs> to boil with at the same time. So I was not able to do that, but it would have been a cool thing. Anyway, guys, thank you for sticking with me for the recipe. Let's go ahead and jump to the footage of the brew day where I kind of break this down a little bit more detailed. So I started out by adding 16 gallons of spring water to my 20 gallon 240 volt claw hammer supply system and I started to heat it up to the first mash rest temperature of 148 Fahrenheit. As this entire volume of water was heating up, I milled out my grist and I measured out all of my water salts and it may look like a lot because, well, there's a lot of water. As the strike water was heating up, I added those water salts in. Once I hit that mash temperature, I pumped eight gallons of water out of the 20 gallon kettle into the 10 gallon kettle with a 120 volt element in it. And I heated that up to 168 Fahrenheit to get ready for the sparge later. At this time, I went ahead and mashed in to the uh, remaining eight gallons of water with my grist. You'll notice that this is an especially thick mash because there's not all that much volume left in the kettle and in the grain basket for the uh, uh, grain to actually mix with the water. At this time, I also took a pH measurement and I saw a spot on pH of 5.38, so I did nothing to the pH. After 30 minutes for the beta amylase rest at 148 Fahrenheit, I went ahead and stepped up to 158 Fahrenheit for the alpha amylase rest. And I let it stay there for 45 minutes. After this 45 minutes was complete, normally at this point I would do a mash out, but I actually elected to skip that for this brew. So I went ahead and I pulled the entire wort that had just been created out from underneath the grain bed and into my one of my seven gallon anvil bucket steel fermenters. This fermenter would get capped up and covered and left to the side while I conducted the sparge that was about to happen. Once I had taken a full eight gallons of wort and stored it in the fermenter, I pulled out the grain basket and let it drain for a bit. And then I initiated a sparge. And the way that I did this was I took the spray valve and the lid and set that on top of the grain basket. And then I pumped the hot sparge water from my 10 gallon 120 volt system up and over the grain bed. And this actually made for a really nice clean, almost like a fly sparge. Uh, it actually took about 30 minutes to get through the full eight gallons of water and uh, was a really nice, efficient sparge. I was actually able to get a pre-boil gravity of 1021 using this method. Once the sparge had actually finished, all the sparge water was out of the 10 gallon system and it was dry. Um, I let the grain basket continue draining and dripping slowly until we had enough wort. And then that resulting wort actually got transferred right back into the 10 gallon 120 volt kettle. As this was 
going on, I started heating it up to boil temperatures. At the same time, I took the double wort uh, that was my first mash and began to transfer that back into the 20 gallon 240 volt kettle and also heat that up to a boil. Once my double wort hit the boil, I began my 60 minute boil timer and added my 60 minute bittering addition, which was half an ounce of Magnum. I let the boil continue for 50 minutes until I got to the 10 minute mark where I added the one pound of D180 dark candy syrup, as well as a Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient. 10 minutes later, I ended the boil, I whirlpooled the wort, and I went ahead and chilled it down to pitching temperatures of about 68 Fahrenheit. I transferred that back into the anvil bucket fermenter and pitched my yeast, which was a one liter starter of WLP 500 slurry. At this time, I also gave it a good healthy dose of one minute of pure oxygen, just to be sure that it fermented nice and healthy. Not long after, my table beer wort actually ended up hitting a boil. So I started the boil in the table beer at the 60 minute mark with about an ounce and a half of Styrian Goldings. I let the boil continue again for another 50 minutes, at which point I added one ounce of Styrian Goldings as well as a Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient. 10 minutes later, I ended the boil, also conducted a Whirlpool, chilled and transferred into my other anvil bucket fermenter and prepared to ferment it. I didn't bother adding any O2 to the wort or deliberately oxygenating it just because of the super low original gravity for this one. So I just went ahead and pitched my one packet of Lalaman Abbey on top of the wort after I transferred it. At this point, I recorded the original gravities for both beers and for the double, I saw an OG of 1070 and for the table beer, an OG of 1024. At this time, I put both of them into my fermentation chamber chest freezer and set it to about 68 Fahrenheit to start the fermentation. So now let's talk about the fermentation. The more complicated part of the brewing process is finished with a party gal behind us. So now we're gonna look at the fermentation segment, which is actually gonna be pretty much the same. I mean, I am fermenting both of these in anvil bucket fermenters in the same fermentation chamber. So they are really gonna have pretty much the same exact fermentation experience as far as the conditions go. I pitched both worts at about 65 degrees with a very large amount of healthy yeast relative to the gravity of each wort. And that's the first and most important thing that you're gonna wanna pay attention to, especially when you're brewing higher gravity beers like the Devil. Um, it does help to have enough healthy cells to get that fermentation going in a good way. Pitching it at 65 degrees and then I turned off the cooling. Basically, so I unplugged the fridge entirely from the temperature controller and left the heat mat in there. So basically I didn't let the temperature of the work get below 68 degrees. So I pitched the 65, naturally let it come up to 68 and then continued to let that fermentation heat get trapped inside the fermentation chamber and raise the whole thing up. And over the course of the week, I saw the temperature chamber get up to about 77 Fahrenheit. That was the highest it got. And at that point, fermentation finished completely and it slowly rode out back down to 68 Fahrenheit. At which point then I plugged in the cooler again and let it just condition at 68 Fahrenheit for about another week. The table beer having much less sugar in general for the yeast to consume uh, didn't really take very long at all. The double on the other hand, while it hit its final gravity within a week, definitely needs a lot more time to condition because uh, of that higher alcohol content. There are some sharp alcohols in there. It is only a week old, so that needs some time to convert, clean up, and slowly mature out to turn into some really nice flavor. So that's my fermentation plan. You can do something different if you wish. However, I would recommend sticking with monastic yeasts for these beers. So I use WLP 500 and Lalaman Abbey Ale. Those are both great options for any of the four uh, monastic ales. So in this beer, I use WLP 500, which is the Chimay strain. Um, now, if you don't have access to White Labs, uh, you can use Yeast 1214, which is the same thing, or potentially the Abbey Ale strain is theoretically the same one. Um, and so they say the same thing about Fermentus T58 as well. Um, I've had very different results from all three of those, and that has probably more to do with pitch rate and strain itself, but still, um, I would recommend sticking with one of those three if you want the Chimay-esque kind of feel. Uh, to me, Lalaman Abbey has the closest replication of the Chimay flavor that I was able to get out of it, uh, especially when I made my triple last year um, with that yeast. 
However, if you want to go uh, a different route, there's also the Belgian Abbey 2, which is uh, Y East 1762, which is the Rochefort strain. And that has a slightly different, slightly more twangy kind of character to it, but still a very distinctive Trappist uh, yeast. But there's also the West Flatteran slash uh, West Mall strain, which is uh, Y East 3787 Trappist High Gravity and also WLP 550. Now, I get a lot of people who are yelling at me because I'm not including Mangrove Jack's yeasts as one of my recommendations, and the reason for that is I keep forgetting to. Uh, nothing wrong with their yeasts, I just don't have them in my area. I've never seen them in homebrew shops, and uh, I really don't go out of my way to go find them. So here are a couple Mangrove Jack's options for your Belgian beers. M31 Belgian Triple, M41 Belgian Ale, and M47 Belgian Abbey. Uh, now, again, I've never actually used any of them, so I can't really say whether or not they're going to have a specific effect on the beer, but many people have recommended those in the comments of some of my beers uh, previously, uh, where I kind of forgot to mention the Mango Jack yeast. So keep those in mind as well, if that's more of the uh, dominant yeast supplier in your area. Either way, you're really gonna wanna make sure with these fermentations that you let the yeast do what it really wants to do. Like I'm doing, I'm leaving it in a fermentation chamber um, my chest freezer that's insulated, and I'm turning off the cooling uh, function entirely. These yeasts, while they should be pitch cold, really do like to get hot. Um, so they do produce a lot of natural heat during fermentation, which kind of accelerates the uh, fermentation process, but also gives off of these amazing esters that these uh, beers are really known for and are really critical to those uh, to the style of the beer so hopefully that really helps you uh, develop your own fermentation schedule for these beers the table beer is going to be treated the exact same way as the double as if it was a monastic ale it came out tasting really really nice it's actually strikingly similar to the Allagash River Trip session ale if you've ever had that one um, just a really nice and interesting very light flavor hey, but I don't want to spoil too much for you because we'll get to that later on in the video Anyway guys, these beers should be ready relatively quickly. The table beer is getting kegged tomorrow, but the double really needs some more time to condition before I get it uh, packaged fully. But until then, cheers. The fermentation overall went very well for each beer, and actually each beer reached its final gravity within the first week due to just having a good healthy yeast pitch for each wort. The table beer being such a low alcohol in general and requiring less conditioning time actually got kegged right away as soon as it hit that final gravity after about seven or eight days and was uh, heavily carbonated just using a standard uh, force carbonation method through my kegging system. The double, on the other hand, I let condition on the yeast cake for another two weeks. Once I was satisfied with the conditioning time on the yeast, I transferred the double into a keg and added in priming sugar and Lalaman CBC1 bottle conditioning yeast. The effect of this was to carbonate the beer in the keg naturally to about three volumes of CO2 to get that higher carbonation level. As soon as the keg conditioning process was complete, I used a counter pressure bottle filler to fill up 750 and 375 milliliter Belgian style bottles and keep the carbonation level in there. This way I can leave the uh, double in the basement for some long-term aging in bottles and crack it open later. I did, however, keep one of the 375 milliliter bottles for the tasting segment of this video. Since I have two beers here today to talk about, we're actually gonna talk about them in sequential order. So I'm gonna start with the lighter and more delicately flavored table beer so that I can get more out of that before moving on to the double, which is gonna be much more intensely flavored. So without further ado, let's get these poured. So the table beer is called Skinny Monk, and it comes in at only 2.5% ABV and 23 IBUs. It pours a beautiful dark gold, almost orange color with a nice white, kind of off-white head, great head retention, and a really delicate structure on the head. It's totally clear. It's actually a relatively highly carbonated beer, so it's actually a lot of fun to watch these bubbles rise up through the beer. The double, on the other hand, and noting to the party guile, is called Fat Monk, and it comes in at 7.9% ABV and about 18 IBUs. It's pouring a darker reddish brown color. It's overall still a little bit hazy. It will probably clear up with some time, but for the sake of the table beer, I wanted to get this video out earlier 
and we will revisit the double later on as it ages. It has an ivory colored head with decent head retention and decent buildup and decent structure, but not everything that the table beer has. Ultimately, I think this will come with some more time. So now I'm gonna go ahead and do the tasting notes for the table beer in its entirety. So if you're only here for the double, just go ahead and skip ahead. All right, so let's go in for aroma. The table beer here, I'm getting a very light, delicate aroma, mostly floral, um, with a little bit of kind of like a subtle spice to it. Um, there's a little bit of a slight fruitiness as well. And a uh, little tiny touch of malt, um, but more aromatic than you might expect for a 2.5% beer. We're gonna move on to the mouthfeel now. So, as I said before, this is highly carbonated. Uh, the mouthfeel on it is very light, very light. Um, not particularly dry, but just a light mouthfeel. It is almost non-alcoholic, so it does make sense that this is gonna be a very light mouthfeel. The flavor does stick around for a while, though. It's not, you know, absurdly dry in any way. It's, um, it's just moderate in all things. But the one thing that is really nice about this is a super high carbonation level is keeping this super lively. Um, very, very refreshing and easy to drink. It's as refreshing as a seltzer water almost. Um, so now we'll go in for our flavor. I'm really proud of this. I'm really actually very happy with the way that the table beer turned out because this is something that I just never really get around to making. And actually party dialing this makes it even more special because it's... Uh, I don't know if I could reproduce this a second time. Despite its relatively weak ABV rating, this actually has a lot of flavor. Um, it's not blowing your taste buds away kind of flavorful. As it is a Belgian pale ale, it really shouldn't actually blow your taste buds away. It should be moderation in everything. There's actually a really nice bready malt flavor in this. And then we get a decent amount of hops. I did that very deliberately. I added more hops into this beer because I knew they would come through more. And the Styrian Goldings, I come across with this lovely herbal note. Um, just nice herbal, slightly spicy, slightly orangey kind of note. Um, it's a really, really pleasant character. It's very delicately flavored. Um, there's a lot of floral notes in here as well, now that I'm picking that up a little bit. Kind of like almost a clover uh, honey note as well. The Abbey yeast unsurprisingly performed very, very well in this. Um, it was fermented very fast and it has some nice but subtle yeast character. It's not particularly estery, it's not particularly phenolic, it's very balanced, um, but there's definitely yeast character in here. You get that Belgian kind of bubblegum note, you get the apricot from that yeast as well. It's something that would pair very, very well with a meal at two and a half percent. It's something you can drink a ton of, you can drink it shamelessly, and uh, it's, it's really got a lot of flavor for that low strength. I'm very happy with that. I'm actually really happy with this one. It's hard for me to find something wrong with it, to be honest. Um, and even if I could find a potential improvement for it, it honestly would be very difficult to replicate this a second time due to that party guile nature, and maybe that's what that blending is for. Uh, but we'll talk about that later. So moving on for the double, we have aroma first. The double has a really much richer aroma to it. Not surprising, right? So it has um, a little bit of like a fig note um, and definitely some darker toasted malts uh, coming through. And then definitely a yeast characteristic coming through as a pear type ester uh, and then a little bit of a bubblegum note as well. Yeah, quite, actually quite aromatic, all things considered. So now let's move in for mouthfeel. Holy crap, that's actually quite the change coming from the table beer. Mouthfeel wise, this is a little bit fuller than the table beer. Uh, not surprising, it both finished at a higher final gravity and is about 6% alcohol more. It's interesting though when you taste them back to back how, how much more body that does actually add. The carbonation in here is still relatively high. Uh, the mouthfeel of the beer is about where it should be, I think. It feels like it's got a decent amount of alcohol. It feels like it's got a relatively normal amount of body. I've definitely made strong Belgian ales that feel drier in the past, and um, perhaps I'm looking for that a little bit in this. That being said, that's a very nitpicky issue, so I wouldn't necessarily waste too much time and effort on it. So now let's go ahead, we'll move into flavor. Uh, this is truly a very flavorful beer, so I'm gonna do my best to unpack all that. <laughs> mm. Wow, yeah. So if you guys have been around for a while, you may remember I made a double about two years ago. Um, 
Didn't quite go as planned. This absolutely blows that out of the water. There is no doubt about that. This is the best Belgian double I have ever made. Um, considering I've only made two, that's not that hard to say, but it's, uh, it's still a pretty good Belgian double. I'm actually really quite happy with the way this turned out. It's only about a month old right now though, and I think it will definitely improve with time. The nice thing too is that it won't need as much time as the triple and the quad that I made last year uh, in terms of conditioning and aging, so that's a good thing. This will definitely benefit from age though. It needs some more time to let some flavors round out, but the reason why I did this uh, back to back is because I wanted to make sure that everyone saw the results of the party guile for both beers. We will revisit the double sometime in the future for sure because it, number one, needs to clarify, and number two, needs to age and gracefully develop uh, some extra flavor in the bottle. But anyway, I did want to have one on standby for this video. And even at a month old, it is absolutely delivering. Um, we have similar flavors to the quad, but subdued in different ways. Coming in at almost 8%, this beer is definitely still something to be reckoned with. But the flavor is very strong, and we get some really, really nice fermentation characteristics out of this. There is this really nice, rich, bready caramel note in there. Dark raisin character, dark fig character. Very, very similar to the quad. It's basically like a scaled down version of the quad's recipe almost. I still use the D180 candy syrup in here for good reason, because that's how you get those dark fig characters. That's how you get that perfumey alcohol note from that strong sugar addition. The yeast go ballistic when they have those simple sugars to ferment. And uh, it comes through with this lovely perfume, rose, and uh, bubble gum notes that are coming through from the yeast and the fermentation. It is just amazing. There's not an excessive amount of caramel in this either, which is really nice to see. That can sometimes be a problem that plagues these darker beers, lots of caramel malts in them. Special B and Caramunic especially can get out of hand very quickly. They get this like really nasty, sweet, but bitter caramel flavor at the same time. It's kind of odd to describe. Um, that can happen in these and it happened to my last double. This is not exhibiting that problem, which is really nice. It's absolutely delicious and it's full of flavor and it makes me very, very happy. As far as brewing this double goes, again, I don't think there's anything I would change. And the thing is, because of the party guile, you can actually brew this double with consistency. So if there was a potential improvement, it could be implemented on this particular recipe. Interestingly enough, I don't actually detect a very significant difference between the yeast characteristics of the Belgian Abbey yeast that I used in the table beer and the WLP 500 repitch that I used in this double. I'm getting the exact same fermentation characteristics off of both of them, and I fermented them under uh, identical conditions, actually. Obviously, there's gonna be subtle differences between manufacturers in terms of White Labs versus Lalamand, in terms of liquid versus dry, but I'm not finding them in this case. So that's pretty nice. So overall, both of these beers were amazing. Uh, I'm really very happy with the way they both turned out. And the party guile process was truly a lot of fun to undertake. It's one of those old school brewing techniques that's just like the coction mashing. It's you do it, not necessarily because you need to, but because it's taking part in a tradition or it's just, you know, trying to tap into some of the old knowledge and, you know, take part in the old traditions of brewing. And as brewers, we are just the latest in a long line of people who have had this profession for millennia. Uh, and it's kind of cool to tap into the roots when you do stuff like party guiling and decoction mashing and stuff like that. Um, and so it's just definitely a lot of fun. Would I do it again? Yeah, actually I would. It was really fun to get two beers out of it. I do think this table beer tastes a lot fuller and a lot nicer because of that party guile. And um, if I had just brewed a 2.5% ABV recipe straight up, I don't think it would be the same. I really don't. And of course, there's one element of party guiling that has yet to be explored in this video, and that is blending. Is this gonna work? So by blending those two beers with absolutely no plan, um, I basically just made a Belgian brown ale that is far tastier than the Belgian brown ale I made uh, several months ago. The reason for that is that the Belgian brown ale I made several months ago was an absolute failure. However, <laughs> this is actually pretty good. This is 
Definitely lighter than the double. The, the flavor's gentler. You still get tons of yeast notes and yeast esters. There's more hops in this now. It's probably five or six percent ABV. That falls under the category of Belgian brown ale. What do you know? I just made three beers for the price of one. So I'm gonna stop babbling because this video is probably getting to be pretty long at this point. So I thank you for your attention. And if you're still here, please go ahead and hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and comment down below, have you party guiled? And if you have, what was your experience like? And if you haven't, does this video make you wanna do it? Because I think you should. I really do think you should if you can. Uh, if you want to support the channel, there's a number of different ways to do so, but I would really appreciate it if you picked up a t-shirt like this one and many others, you can find that in the merch store that's down in the description box as well as below it if you're watching on a desktop computer. I also have a Patreon and my Patreon supporters really have made a massive difference. They really have been the ones that have been driving the production behind this channel and that helps out so much. If either of those things aren't your thing though, I do have channel memberships, there is also the super thanks button and all of those things really do mean a lot to me and I appreciate them. If you wanna check out what equipment that I've been using to brew with and to film with and to work with in general, um, I have an Amazon store where whatever's available on Amazon is listed on that store. So if you wanna check that out for more information, please go do so, it's down in the description box. I also am available on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer, so check those links out for some more additional content between YouTube uploads. So thank you guys for watching all the way to the end of the video. It means a lot to me. I put a ton of work into these videos, averages between 20 and 35 hours of production, so I appreciate you watching all the way to the end. And until the next one, cheers.